Guernsey may be a small island in the Royal British Commonwealth, but its citizens had a key part in the organisation's history. The Commonwealth is no longer a global power, but it still binds the countries that were once in it together. So what involvement did these residents have? I think one of the most interesting about going to Trinidad was getting to know some of the Trinidadians, mm. getting to know other people's way of life, enjoying the food, enjoying the hospitality, eating the kind of food that I didn't know anything about before I went, seeing, um, dancing the beans. Now the coffee beans would be picked and they would lay them on a mat and they did a dance to music. Nowadays people, uh, the opportunity to travel is much more extensive and people travel and they, to them, if you mention this, they say, oh yes, we've seen this, we've seen this. But to me, it was totally unique and a very, very interesting experience. Also, there were various ceremonies on the beach, um, on a large rock near on the uh, west coast, an Indian sect used to have public cremations which sounds pretty horrendous now, but we all accepted that. There they were many religions, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, I think quite a variety of religions. And of course, the, one of the big things in Trinidad was the carnival. And the carnival was always old mass for a few nights and then new mass when everybody wore new costumes and it all finished on uh, the night of Shrove Tuesday. We stayed at the um, Hilton in Port of Spain and we could hear the music all night which wasn't bad for just five nights but you wouldn't have wanted it to go on and but suddenly on the Tuesday night midnight everything stopped. Guernsey also has a rich military history with some of its islanders serving in the army of the Royal British Commonwealth. Tell us about a bit about your personal experiences and yeah, yeah I, I went there as the commanding officer of the British forces in Belize and I had a garrison of about 300 people altogether that was wives children and everything it was a, a full community uh, we had our own facilities our own hospital our own uh, education facilities and a school for the children uh, and everything else and we we used to take soldiers coming out from England on training and we would go often have one or two thousand soldiers coming from England to do jungle training in Belize and our little group used to look after them. But by living there we lived there as an independent garrison so we worked very closely with the local people yeah. and were very, part, very much part of the community and welcome as part of that community. Yeah. Um, we used to regularly deal with the, the, the local government officials of course but we were part of all the sort of social activities in the country as well. You know any, uh, any events that the country were, were hosting one of them in particular was the Prime Minister's Conference for the whole of the Caribbean was hosted in Belize and they asked us as part of the garrison to, um, to be there to help and to help entertain and, and join in. So we were really made to feel very welcome um, and it was a very successful relationship we had with Belize. Probably the last time I had really close contacts was when I was in Washington. I worked in uh, Washington as part of the Embassy in Washington and we used to get together as part of the Commonwealth Australia, New Zealand and the other countries. Um, we used to get together every month and meet up socially, uh, but it's also uh, very much a, an interchange between us to discuss Commonwealth matters. And whilst obviously serving in America uh, and being a, a sort of like a UK diplomat, a military attaché, um, we would work very closely with Americans, but we still had this very strong relationship with the other Commonwealth countries that were also military attachés in Washington. And it was very interesting uh, that we all very had very similar thoughts on lots of things, yeah. and we had a, and a common a common uh, idea of the way to take things forward, yeah. and it was a, a very strong, independent lobby group really the Commonwealth countries uh, for anything that we wished to get over to the Americans um, in diplomatic terms. Yeah. yeah. But not all people aiding the military were soldiers. Anne White served in a canteen for soldiers in India during World War Two. Well, I go back four generations. Yeah. To my great grandfather, yeah. who went out there as an ophthalmic surgeon by sailing ship round the Cape because there was no Suez Canal. Yeah. And he 
finally ended up in the chair of ophthalmology in Calcutta oh, yeah. and was still known when I was out there in the 40s and I had my eyes tested by an Indian optician and he, when he, I told him this story he said Colonel Sanders he is a god to us okay. <laughs> so that was the beginning yeah. and uh, where did you um, go for your education I was educated in England I lived with my grandparents then, which was very much the pattern of life for children from India. I didn't see my parents for three years after I'd been left at home, but then I saw them a little more often after that. And I was expecting to take my school certificate in the summer of 39 and got a cable from my father. They could see the war coming better than we could. Te telegram summoning me out. Mm -hmm. And two days later, I flew in a flying boat from Southampton. First night in Athens, the second nice night in uh, no, Vastra. And the next afternoon I arrived in Karachi. Mr. Geisha is a Canadian, currently living in Guernsey. He comes from a family of military men. He served in the war alongside his father and brother. He had an interesting story to tell us. And uh, just prior to, somewhat prior to D-Day, I was pulled from my unit and sent to a British headquarters, British divisional headquarters, actually British Army headquarters, Army headquarters, where I was to be a liaison officer when we arrived in in Europe and because the Canadian Army was to take over the center section on Juneau Beach where the third division of the Canadian Army landed on D-Day and that was to be the Canadian Army's front but and they would take it over after we would got moving in in uh, France. So I arrived on D-1 and uh, all by myself with a driver and a jeep. <laughs> and we, uh, I went and found out where all the various base properties were that we would be responsible for, the ammunition dumps, the, the supply dumps, where the petrol lines came in from England and where we could fill up the, the uh, jerry cans, as they called them. Uh, prior to us going, they had secretly laid this petrol line all the way from England to within a few uh, hundred yards of the beach without the Germans having a clue. They did it at night, divers laid it, and then as soon as we landed, they came and hooked it up and brought it up on shore. Wendy Letizia visited many countries around the world, representing the UK as a diplomat. And every week, she sent a letter to her mother who documented the letters. How many letters do you think you have? Like, oh, I, I, I just can't think. I, I really have never tried to, to um, count. But if I wrote almost one a week for twenty years, well, of course I didn't because there was leave, and um, then sometimes I was too busy. And um, she kept all my letters, or more or less, as you can see, in date order. The road to Jalalabad and through the Khyber Pass I've described before. Just the other side of Jalalabad. There's an old Buddhist settlement just excavated by French archaeologists which we wanted to visit. At the independence exhibition here a month or two ago, they had marvellous photos of it which whetted our appetites. And we were told that to visit it we had to get a permit from the Institute of Archaeology here. We duly went round, had a job to find it, were told the director was out but would be returning, waited, he didn't return, we were told to send an embassy messenger for the permits the next day. Did so, got a note back to say the director was in Herat, that we couldn't have a permit and that in any case the fines were all covered up and we couldn't see anything. So we decided to go without a permit and hope for the best. We left the main road in Jalalabad and followed the vague gesturings of a policeman and headed off down an appalling rough dirt road into the vastness of a dusty valley 
punctuated by irrigation ditches. In this documentary we have covered but a few people and roles that Guernsey has played in the Royal British Commonwealth. It still remains a strong member of the community, participating in the Commonwealth Games and as a strong member of the Royal British Commonwealth Society.